The title of the message today is What Manner of Man Is This? We'll stand together please and read responsibly Mark chapter 4 verse 41 through or verse 35 through 41. And the scriptures are all printed in your bulletin, and if you didn't bring a Bible, you can just read them from the bulletin. Beginning with verse 41 of Mark chapter 4. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when the and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it to be found in the And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thank you. Be seated, please. Our subject this morning, what manner of man is this? The disciples with our Lord had embarked on a little trip across the Galilean Sea. And suddenly, as it happens often on that little sea, a great tempestuous wind came sweeping over the boat. And the water began to fill the boat. And they were in danger, they thought, of probably drowning. And Jesus was asleep in the back part of the, of, the, of the ship. And they cry out to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They were sort of rebuking the Lord, lying there asleep, and here we're in danger of drowning, so they thought. And Jesus arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he rebuked the sea, and he said, Peace! Be still, and the wind ceased, and the waves subsided. There was great calm. This is the Master. This is our Savior. He has great power. The first thing I'd like to mention about what manner of man this is, is to mention his pre-existent position. That will tell us something of the manner of man that we worship. His pre-existent position position. Plato was a Greek philosopher. And one day a student asked the great teacher, Plato, Plato, is there a God? He answered, I don't know. But if there is, someday he will reveal himself to man and when he does, he will do it through a word. And he was right. Because the Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. That's a capital W. It refers to a person. The person is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and the Word, Jesus, was with God. And the Word was God. Here's an unequivocal statement that Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, is God. And the Word was made flesh. That's His incarnation. And dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. He's the only person in history who lived before He was born. We're born and then we become alive. He was alive before He was born. He predates all history. He predates eternity. 
and he continues to live in the same body in which he was crucified. He antedated his birth at Bethlehem by saying, before Abraham was, I am. Now Abraham antedated the Lord by hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet he says, before Abraham was, I am. Present tense. I am the eternal God. The word I am, as I pointed out last Sunday, is a term used only of God. He is the great I am. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So he is the Alpha and the Omega. You read that in Revelation many times and in other places. The great Alpha and Omega. That means there was none before him and there is none after him. He is the beginning and he is the ending. He is the eternal one. The soldiers came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they asked, inquiring about Jesus, he stepped forward and he said, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. When he spoke those ineffable words, I am, they fell backward on their backs, paralyzed, unable to move because his mighty power invoked in that name I am, which is used only of him, the great God of heaven. He is God in human flesh. And as He spoke to them and identified Himself as the I Am, they fell under His mighty power. That's the same I Am that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. When Moses approached the burning bush to see this great sight, why the bush was not consumed, the voice came from the burning bush, Abraham, Draw not nigh hither. Pull off thy shoes, for the ground thou standest on is holy ground. And then he sent on a commission Moses down to Egypt to deliver Israel. And Moses said, they're going to want to know your name. If I go down there, they'll want to know who sent you. And what is his name? If you've been with God, tell us his name. So what name shall I give them? And the I am spoke from the burning bush and said, I am that I am. I am that one, that I am, that the Bible speaks of. I am He. That's a name that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. I am as a name. But it does when you read the Gospel of John. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. You see, he told them seven times that he was the I am that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. He's the I am, the ineffable name of the holy and living God. The deity of the Son shines forth in John 1.1. And he pre-existed as God in John 1. He was predicated as God in Isaiah 9, 6. He professed to be God in John 5, 18. He was proclaimed God in 1 Timothy 3, 16. He was promoted as God in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. He was petitioned as God in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. His perfections are God's perfections. He has the the attribute of eternity in John 8, 58. He possesses omnipotence, which only God possesses in John 10, 28. He possesses omnipresence in Matthew 18, 20, which only God has. And he possesses holiness in Hebrews 7, 26. He is love in John 15, 6. And He is the name and title of God in John 20, 28. And He is the worship of God's people in John 5, 23. You see, you can just ransack the Bible from cover to cover. And everywhere you read, He is God. He is the Almighty. 
He is the creator of the universe. And he descended to become man. He's the everlasting one. The one who has no beginning. The one who will never have an ending. He's the eternal one. The one from eternity. And so, what manner of man is this? He is the God-man. The pre-existent one. The one who had no beginning. And then, I would say that he was made flesh or became flesh. Here we have the incarnation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And that's the irreducible minimum that you can believe about the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. One must believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in human flesh. And anything less than that is not acceptable to God. In the beginning, these words teach His eternity. In the beginning, the Word was with God. Those words teach His equality with God. He stands on an equal plane with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. There is no rank in the Godhead. They are all one together. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And there is only one God. Three persons in the divine Godhead. And the Word was God. That de declares His deity. The same was in the beginning with God, His preexistence. He was not flesh. When the morning stars serenaded the infant earth, wrapped in swaddling clothes of light, lying in the arms of the great Jehovah, he was not flesh when the first ray of light beamed across the darkened universe in chaotic darkness. He was not flesh when the first bird warbled his sweet song across the earth. He was not flesh when the first flowers bloomed perfumed the earth with their sweet scent. He was not flesh when the first rivers flowed into the deep or when the first rose opened its ruby heart where there was no eye to behold it or when the first lily bared its white beauty to a wandering universe. He was not flesh then, but he became flesh. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He's the glue that holds everything together. He's the one that keeps the planets in their orbits. He's the one that brings the sun around. He's the one that makes the morning star to appear. He is the creator, the mighty creator. That's what manner of man he is. He is our mighty creator. But he was made flesh. Made flesh. Eternally God made flesh. Uncreated, but made flesh underived and unbegun but made flesh. This is the orthodox order of deity's doctrine. The eternal has invaded the temporal. The creator has assumed creaturehood. And the Christ of eternity has become the Jesus of history. He was not half God and half man. He was very God of very God and the man. Christ Jesus, making Him the God-man. There is no other like Him. There never has been, there never will be. He was not just God in man. He was the unique God-man. In His essential deity, He was never made at all. He has always been. He's the only begotten of the Father. He was never created as the Jehovah Witnesses say. Nobody elected him to his place in the Godhead. He's always been there. Nobody gave him the titles that he bears. He's always had them. 
In the beginning, write that across his deity. In the beginning, write that across his sonship. In the beginning, write that across the unwritten page of the unrevealed past. Go back, if you will, before the centuries moved out in chronicled order. Before the millenniums began their measured march through history, he stood as the head of all things. He became the man, Christ Jesus. Always existing in eternity past as God. God the Son. And yet the Son became flesh. He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. That brings us to the fact of the virgin birth. How did He become flesh? He was born of a sweet virgin named Mary. Mary was not the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus. And it is true that Jesus is God. But that does not make it true that Mary is the mother of God. Mary gave humanity to the Lord Jesus Christ. She did not give Him deity. He already possessed it. But she gave Him His humanity. She gave Him a body in which He could enter the human race because to die for the human race would take a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice from the human race. And there's no other that could qualify except the virgin-born Son of God Himself. I know that men question virgin birth today. They have no need for it. He was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And thou shalt call His name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And God states in unequivocal terms that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And that's all I need to believe it. If God says it, I believe it. And God said it. Some years ago, one of our Southern Baptist preachers named Roland Lebel went to pastor one of the churches in a southern city. A few weeks later, he met a doctor on the street, a medical doctor, and this doctor thought he would set Dr. Lebel up by asking him a question. He said, Recently, a lady came into our hospital and gave birth to a boy. And she told us the boy had no father. And then he looked at Dr. Lavelle and said, What say you? Would you believe her story? Now, he thought he had the preacher over a barrel. And this is the answer the preacher gave him. Doctor, if that woman's son had been born in answer to the prophets 1,500 years, if he had been born as the very angels of heaven sang praises unto God for the wondrous event, if he had lived a morally and spiritually bankrupt world and his enemies could not convict him of a single sin, if he, however, went to open blind eyes and cleanse lepers, if he raised the dead and cast out demons, if he spoke words of truth and wisdom such as the world has never known, if evil men had taken him outside the city and nailed him to a cross, and the very noonday sun had hid his face in shame from the terrible deed, if they had buried him and put on a platoon of soldiers to guard his grave, lest he come forth from the grave, yet on the third day he had come forth and had appeared for forty days with many infallible proofs of his resurrection from the dead. If he had ascended to heaven from the highest mountain in the area in sight of everybody at noonday, if for 1,900 years His very name and message had blessed the world with such mighty blessings as Christianity has given to the world, if His ministry had built orphanages and hospitals and asylums and churches 
and Christian homes through all those years. If I had needed a Savior and had cast myself upon His mercy and He had done as much for me as one has done whom I have trusted, who was born of a virgin without a human father, if all of this had been true of Him, yes, Doctor, I would have believed that mother's story. I would have believed it too. Because I believed it happened once in history when our Lord was born of a virgin named Mary. And Mary provided her a body. The second point I want to make in answer to the question, what manner of man is this? Is his precious person. 1 Peter 2.7 says, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. He's precious to me, and I believe He's precious to you, or you wouldn't even be here this morning. He is precious. I think of the marvel of His personality. Son of God and Son of Man. One person with two natures, human and divine. In His human nature, He suffered. In His divine nature, he could not suffer. He had a true body of flesh and blood like the bodies of other men. Mary's pregnancy gave birth to the child, Jesus, affirming the Savior's true humanity. He was recognizable as a Jew, John 4, 9. He was a carpenter who had brothers and sisters, Matthew 13, 55. Ultimately, he suffered greatly in his human body. He experienced the pain of scourging in John 19.1. On the cross, he thirsted as a man and cried out, I thirst. John 19.28. These are elements that emphasize his true humanity. He had a human soul and spirit. He was a complete human being, body, soul, and spirit, just as we are. Before the cross, he was troubled in his soul, as we sometimes are. For the anticipation of the cross, there was self-consciousness that he was to bear the sins of his people. An emotion in his breast as he felt his human spirit at the death of his friend Lazarus. He wept. Human tears. He was troubled in his human spirit when he ultimately died and gave up his spirit and committed it back to the Father. He had human names. He's called the son of David. He's a descendant of King David. He was also called Jesus, Matthew 121, the equivalent of the Old Testament Yahshua, meaning Yahweh saves or Jehovah saves. He was referred to as a man by the Apostle Paul. As a man, he was also a mediator between God and men. He had the characteristics of a human being. He became hungry, Matthew 4, 2. He became tired and stopped at the well to rest and asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. He had human emotions. He wept over the grave of Lazarus. He felt compassion over the people because they had no shepherd. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. He experienced grief. Everything that human beings possess, Jesus possessed. He was a man. He was the man, Christ Jesus. When he stood before Pilate, Pilate cried out, Ike homo, behold the man. This is the man. He's not a man. He is the man. Even the ungodly recognize his origin. So human he can become thirsty. But so divine he can say, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. So human he can become hungry. But so divine he can feed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes and a few loaves of bread. 
So human he grew in stature and wisdom and knowledge. And yet the Bible says in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So human that he needed sleep as he slept on this little boat in the storm. And yet so divine that he could calm the raging sea and still the storm. So human that he prayed, but so divine that he never had a sin to confess. What manner of man is this? This is the manner of man that he is. Then I would revert to his potent power. Potency is a word that we use to mean power. Jesus had all power. He said in the Bible, all power is given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He had all power. He had power over disaster. He stilled the storm. He had power over demons. He clothed the poor, pitiful, demon-possessed man in his right mind and put him back in his clothing and made him whole again. He had power over disease. He said to the woman, as she reached out and touched the hem of his garment, who touched me? He knew exactly who touched him. He wanted to elicit from her a public confession of her faith in him. She knew who he was. She touched the blue hem of his garment, which speaks of the one who came down from heaven. And she recognized who he was. And she said, as she had this terrible disease of homophilia, she was a bleeder. And it was the slightest cut on her body would bleed for days. And she recognized that this is the one come down from heaven. That's the blue head flinge on his garment. And she said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And as Jesus passed by, she reached out and touched that blue hem of his garment. And instantly, she was made whole. The blood flowed staunch. And she was cured in an instant. And Jesus said, who touched me? He perceived that something went out of him and into her. And every time a sinner bows before the cross, and acknowledges Christ as Savior. Something from God comes into his heart and he's saved and born again. Something from God comes in. I remember the night I got down on my knees and asked God to save me a sinner. And something came into my heart. Been there ever since. It was the Son of God. It was the Spirit of God. Oh, he has power over disease. Then he has power over death. The daughter of Jairus was dying. And Jairus sent for Jesus. And he said, Lord, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come. And Jesus came to the little home of Jairus. And he put the unbelievers out so that only he and the girl were a lot more there. And Jesus came over this dead body of this little girl laid his hand upon her and said, Tabitha, kumai, I say unto thee, arise. And the little dead girl stood up. And he said, give her something to eat. You know, when we have a sinner saved in our church, we need to give him something to eat. When he's been saved by the grace of God, and God has raised him up from the death, we have a responsibility to give Him something to eat. And that's why we preach Jesus in this church. The only one that can sustain His spiritual nurture. The only one that can satisfy the thirst and the hungers of His soul. We give them something to eat. We don't have time to preach politics. We don't have time nor inclination to preach on the social efforts of the day. We need to give them something to eat. They need the Word of God that they might grow their minds. 
He's not only the Lord over disaster and demons and disease and death, but He changed the water to wine as He went to a wedding. And they always provided wine at the wedding. The servants came to Mary and said, We have no more wine. We've run out of wine. And that's a disgrace in a Jewish wedding to run out of wine at a wedding. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, They have no wine. And Jesus said, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled the water pots with water. Six burdens. And then he spoke the life-giving word and the water was changed to wine. And he said, you can give them wine. The water changed to wine. He reversed the course of nature, but he changed the water to wine. How much does Jesus have to do to convince people that he's God? How much does he have to do? He did everything imaginable. He raised the dead. He healed the leper. He stilled the storm. He healed disease. What does he have to do to prove? And yet, blind men today say, I just don't see how that could be. They remind me of the lady that came to Dr. Pettenfield one day when he had brought a message on the virgin birth of Christ. And she said to him, Dr. Pettengill, I don't see how a woman unaided by a male could give birth to a son. He said, lady, that's nothing. I don't understand how a lady can give birth to a son by the aid of a male. A birth of a child is a miracle. A miracle. He fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two little fishes. He healed the lepers and the blind. What does he have to do to prove himself? He did everything that God does. And if people can't see God in him, it's because they're blind. They're blind. They look upon him. They read about him in the Bible. They hear him preach. And they look on him and they see nothing, nothing but a Galilean peasant. But I looked on him one night and I saw in him God Almighty. And millions of others have looked on him and seen God in him because he is God. What manner of man is this? I would prefer you to his propitiating death upon the cross of Calvary. The Father gave him a mission. He was to come to earth, take upon himself human flesh, go to the cross and die as a substitute for sinners. And in his unselfish devotion to the will of God, he went. He said, how I am straightened until it be accomplished. And obediently, compliantly, acquiescently, and submissively, he gave himself to the death of the cross. Uncomplainingly, passively, he deferred to the Father's will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. He had to die for sin. There was no other way they could be saved. They cannot be saved by works. They cannot be saved by churches. They cannot be saved by preachers. They must be saved by Christ. Because God's wrath is upon sin. And all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There was an incident that took place in the life of Israel. As they journeyed through the wilderness, they violated God's commandment not to intermarry with the heathen, not to have fellowship with the heathen, not to enter into any concourse of any kind with the heathen. They were to be a separate people. And suddenly, one man went out and got a Midianitish woman 
and brought her into the camp of Israel and took her into his tent and was committing immorality with her. And God in his wrath sent a plague upon Israel and 24,000 died. And there was one man in the camp of Israel that had the discernment to know what had to be done. This man's name was Phineas. And Phineas knew that there had to be a sacrifice made. There had to be an atonement made to turn away the wrath of God or all Israel would have perished. And the Bible says in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and he took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel in the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. God stopped the plague. 24,000 have already fell dead. And they would have all died had not an atonement been made. A sacrifice had to be made. A blood. Those that died in the plague were 24,000. Phineas, the son of Abiezar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned by wrath away from the children of Israel. For he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy, and made an atonement for the children of Israel. He made an atonement on the cross of Calvary for me and for you. And he turned away the wrath of God that was upon us. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins and under the wrath of God. And Jesus, by his death on the cross, by his atonement of shedding blood, turned away the wrath of God from all of his blood. All those he wrote in the Lamb's Book of Life, he made an atonement. For them. What manner of man is this that he would go into Pilate's hall beaten and bruised and beaten nearly to death? Then have a cross laid on his back and then go to the cross of Calvary, have the nails driven through his hands and feet, and hang there between heaven and earth and cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew the answer to that. What manner of man is this? Jesus said, man hath not greater friend than he laid down his life for a friend. No greater love than to lay down his life for a friend. That's what he did for me. Then I speak of his plenteous pardon. The marvel of his salvation. There was a man by the name of Mel Trotter. Mel Trotter was a drunkard. He was such a besotted drunkard that when his little baby died, he went down to the funeral home and he slipped the little shoes off of the baby's feet and took them down to a bar and asked the bartender if he could trade those baby shoes for another drink. And of course, the bartender refused. And he went out, staggering down the street. And he heard some music coming from a storefront. And he went in and sat down. And a man stood up and began to preach. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And he said, I wonder if Christ's blood 
could cleanse me of my sin? And the preacher said, Whosoever will may come. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He jumped to his feet and ran to the front and he said, If it's for me, I want it. If Jesus would save a wretched drunkard like Mel Trotter, I want to be saved. The preacher had prayer with him and read some scripture with him, pointed him to Christ. Mel Trotter established 42 rescue missions in the city of Chicago, became one of the great preachers of America because of his plenteous part. There's an old song that goes like this. It took a miracle to put the sun in place. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. But when He saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. And He's the one that can do it. He's the miracle man. He's the manner of man that I've been proclaiming this morning. I just wonder this morning, if you've availed yourself of His offer of mercy, I close with His punishing return. 2 Thessalonians, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. This man is also a judge. He will be a Savior to those who will have Him, and He will be a judge to those who reject Him. Why is He coming? He's coming back to this earth to bring judgment upon the wicked and to rescue you and I from this ungodly world and to take us into glory to live with Him for all eternity. I wonder this morning, have you received Him as your Savior? He can do for you what no one else can do. He is the manner of man. He is the God man. He is God Himself in human flesh. And He stands today before you saying, Come unto me, all of ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's stand together, please. We want to sing one verse just as I am. If you're here today and you've never received Christ, right where you stand, you can receive Him. And then if you have, and if you will, come and give me your hand and let me know that you've trusted Him today. We're not saved because we walk down an aisle or get on our knees. We're saved because Jesus died for us. But He asks us to pray. Profess Him publicly before men. So if you're here without Christ and you you need Him. Trust Him now where you are. And then come and say, yes, today I have trusted Him. I receive Him today. I will, as we say, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou biddest me come. be dismissed in prayer. So happy to see the kitchen's back and these other folks visiting with us. You get around and shake hands with them. Let's bow together now in prayer. And as we pray, Brother uh, Dan, would you dismiss us, please? Well, we thank you that you called us here today, Lord. We've heard your message. Lord, we pray that we comprehend the great truths we've heard today, Lord. That we do know we have a Savior. That 
is our God. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings there, for your provisions for our life. Lord, help us be witness to you as we go about this week, Lord. We pray that you bring us back next Sunday, Lord. We 